Nature is filled with wonders. But equally magnificent are the wonders of the human body. Within us are uncanny abilities for both perception and navigation in a three-dimensional world. In this episode, we'll look at the hidden systems that make possible this astounding spatial awareness. Human performance is a remarkable thing to watch. But as we saw in our previous episode, behind the scenes in the human body, there are countless micro-machines and engineered systems that make it possible. And to achieve spatial awareness, some incredibly complex problems must be solved. We appreciate great athletes, but we don't often think about the unseen systems behind their talent. Like what enables a wide receiver to assess his proximity to the quarterback and other players? And how does he so smoothly make adjustments to the ball when a pass is underthrown? Well, there are many biomechanical processes at play. And today, we'll look briefly at just three of them. Vision, seeing with depth perception. Hearing, knowing what's around you without seeing it. And something called proprioception, knowing how the hundreds of parts of your body are positioned at any given moment. And along the way, it's important to ask some obvious questions. What does it take to make systems that can do these things? And what are our bodies trying to tell us? We'll start with vision which has enormously difficult problems to solve. Basically, light entering your eye must be converted into electrical signals that must be transmitted to the brain, where millions of signals from two eyes must be instantaneously unified into a three-dimensional view of the world around us. So the sight we enjoy is only possible because of many elaborate chemical, mechanical, and optical processes. The process of vision begins when photons of light enter the eye and are focused on the retina, which has millions of photoreceptor cells. There are two types, rods and cones. We'll look at the rods first. There are around 120 million of them in each eye. The rods contain a protein called rhodopsin. Attached to it is retinol. This tiny protein is a key component because when a photon strikes retinol, it's like hitting a switch, and it sets off a cascade of chemical reactions, which results in an electrical signal to the brain. Which is amazing. But now the retinol protein is misshapen, so it can't respond to another photon. So now we have a new problem to solve. You're right. The photon strike changes the shape of retinol. Now the switch has to be reset to receive another photon. But the eye has a solution. The retinol molecule is transported to this restoration area. There, specialized machines go to work. These enzymes restore it back to its ready shape. Then, it's transported back to the rod cell, and we're ready to go for the next photon. Now, let's look at the cones, which are especially impressive. The photochemical reaction for the cones is similar to the rods. There are about 6 million of them in each eye and their job is to react to specific wavelengths of light. See how these cones respond to short wavelengths, which is blue, these to longer wavelengths, green, and these a little longer, which is red. Combining these signals is what enables us to experience an enormous range of colors, actually several million different colors. And now for the final step. After the amazing conversion of light into electrical signals, they travel to the visual cortex. What the right field of vision in each eye sees goes to the left visual cortex, and what the left field of vision sees goes to the right. Signals from 6 million cones and 120 million rods in each eye. That's a lot of data channels to make sense of. How does the brain know which signal comes from which cone or rod, and where these are spatially in relation to each other? And how are these interpreted into a three-dimensional map of the world around us? It's a great question, Steve, and we don't really have an answer. 
we saw the brilliantly engineered systems that got the signals to the brain. But how the brain processes them is one of the more profound mysteries of the human body. But you have to admit, it's a wonderful gift to be able to experience the world around us in this way. Our next component of spatial awareness is hearing. The musical note A. Our ears convert these pressure waves into electrical signals that our brains then interpret. The physics required to make all this work are almost beyond belief. I could spend hours describing the engineering in your ears, but today let's just cover the highlights. As sound waves traveling through the air strike the eardrum, the three bones of the ossicles transfer the energy to the cochlea, which is filled with fluid. Now, Here's what's remarkable about this transmission. Sound travels differently through water than through air, which is less dense. But these fluid waves in the ear match the loudness and frequency of the air waves. Sound engineers call this impedance matching, which is an extremely tricky problem to solve. But the incredibly engineered ossicles do it flawlessly. Now, here's what happens inside the fluid filled cochlea. Throughout the cochlea are these sensory hair-like structures called stereocilia that ride these fluid waves. These movements are turned into electrical signals. In each part of the cochlea, different hair cells are tuned to different specific frequencies. Hair cells at the base of the cochlea detect higher pitch sounds, such as a piccolo. Toward the top of the spiral, we detect progressively lower pitch sounds, such as a trumpet. At the very top, the lowest pitch sounds, such as a tuba. The auditory nerve carries the electrical signals to the brain, which interprets them as sounds that we recognize and understand. You just can't describe this as anything other than an engineering marvel. But what's amazing to me is the signal processing of the brain. Think about it. We receive many different types of sounds with a wide variety of frequencies that are coming from all different directions and all at the same time. Again, how does the brain know how to sort and interpret these signals? Well, like vision, it's a mystery. Signal processing in the brain is one more secret of the human body that we haven't been able to figure out. Nonetheless, like you said, the ear is a true marvel of engineering. Now for the third part of spatial awareness, proprioception. This outfielder can't see his glove with his eyes fixed on the ball. So how does his body know exactly when and where to move the glove? What your body has to do to make adjustments without visual cues is more remarkable than you might think. Embedded in your muscles are proprioceptors these are microscopic stretch sensors that detect the length and rate of change of your muscle fibers and send the data to the brain. With this information, the brain knows what all the muscles and joints are doing at every moment. Basically, how each body part is positioned in space. The brain is continuously comparing the current positions with what it wants the body to do and sending signals back to all the muscles to make the intended adjustments. Here's another athlete focused on the ball. Again, his brain is tracking the position of every body part, and the brain is signaling precisely when and how much to turn the left hip, raise the right knee, and extend his foot through the ball. So vision, hearing, and proprioception together provide you with spatial awareness, a three-dimensional understanding of the world around you. Whenever I see an amazing capability like spatial awareness, I ask myself how I would design a system that could do this. Interestingly, spatial awareness is one of the more difficult capabilities when designing robots that need to interact with their surroundings. Same for autonomous vehicles. So for these engineers, building spatial awareness into their inventions is a big challenge. 
When designing a system, engineers always start with the end goal in mind. Using a principle called separation of concerns, they break that goal into separate subproblems. Then, when they have solutions for all the subproblems, they compose them into a larger system that achieves the original goal. So let's walk through these engineering layers for spatial awareness. It requires the processes of not only vision, hearing, and proprioception, but a few others that we didn't cover. Each of these are profoundly difficult to build. They merge hundreds of millions of raw data points into a clear and accurate perception of our surroundings. And they do it with no lag between when something happens and when we experience it. So our perception is instantaneous. These remarkable processes are composed from component subsystems. The brain, eyes, ears, proprioceptors, and others. These component subsystems are composed from an array of lower level capabilities. There's communication between hundreds of millions of components, thousands of control systems, information processing for hundreds of millions of independent electrical signals, and many more. These capabilities are composed from an even larger array of basic tools with many different types of switches, molecular machines, sensors, signaling, and many more complex gadgets. Composition bottoms out at chemistry and physics, choosing the right materials and chemicals for each task. And for engineers, a working system of this complexity typically involves thousands of difficult trade-offs and design choices. This is the design approach, which involves intentional action to design and build spatial awareness. The alternative to design is an approach that excludes intentional action, where humans are the result of a long series of cosmic accidents. This approach involves a somewhat fuzzy process known as emergence. With emergence, the starting point is in the bottom, where chemicals must spontaneously assemble to make things, like switches. Earlier we saw retinol, the essential switch for vision. We all understand switches, a complete and coherent assembly of parts. Yet it's completely useless until it's applied within a larger, fully interconnected system where the switch becomes part of the complete system. In the same way, retinal proteins are of no use unless they're properly organized into a larger assembly of other parts. The same is true of the many different molecular machines, sensors, signaling devices, and so many other tools. And then there are the capabilities, though we have no idea how the unguided forces of emergence could fashion each of them. The higher we go, the more difficult the challenges that emergence must overcome, from the components to the staggeringly complex core processes. And remember, these layers upon layers of emergence must occur in the complete absence of intentional action. The chances of emergence resulting in life can be compared to a junkyard filled with every kind of part you'll need to build a car. One day, it gets hit by a tornado what will emerge from all that force is a very different looking junkyard, but no cars will be assembled along the way. A tornado adds a lot of energy, but can't provide coherent organization. In the top-down approach, intention solves a design problem. Under emergence, this is no longer a design problem, but a search problem. At each layer, unguided, blind trial and error must find a solution in what is, for all practical purposes, an infinitely large search space. So this brings us to the crux of the issue. There are only two possible ways to make these systems. Through the intentional action of composing a coherent system, or through unintentional accidents, that is, intention-free emergence. We just saw the staggering complexity of human components and processes. Blind search over an infinite search space will never get there. So the other answer, that someone intended this to happen, seems the only reasonable possibility. This is really the most important question in life. 
Am I a cosmic accident? Or am I here because of intention?